Boker Tov. Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome to the Aliyah this morning. Pardon me, my coat's all messed up. There we go. Uh, glad you're here. Welcome. Today we get to discuss uh, one of my favorite topics, and that is about the suffering Messiah and how it is the suffering of the Messiah is intrinsic to Jewish thought. We're going to read that today. We're going to find out that out today. I, I love to talk about this topic. I'm debating on the topic for Shabbat. I have a couple of directions to go, possibly. And this particular conversation is one of those topics, uh, specifically about the idea that um, that a Zodic can die for our sins. So, you know, through the years, I have listened to anti-missionary and anti-missionary just as a point of education for those who might not know is uh, usually a jew typically a rabbi not necessarily a rabbi but typically a rabbi who uh tries to prevent jews from becoming christians which by the way i wholeheartedly support god forbid a jew should become a christian yikes which would include a messianic um which is the same thing so anyway, the anti-missionary's job, mission, is to prevent that and to try to uh, basically destroy uh, Christian theology and teaching, which isn't hard to do if you use the Bible, um, and so on and so forth. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the anti-missionary is confronting Christianity, okay? Um, and in so doing, one of the things... 99% of what they say is 100% fact, okay? And I I agree with a lot of what they say because I like facts and reality. Um, but there are sometimes they say things in maybe in their, I don't know, in their zeal or I really don't know the, the, the reason, but they say things uh, that, well, aren't fact, such as, you know, I've I've heard the phrase, for instance, <clears throat> there's nothing in Judaism about a Messiah who dies. Or there's nothing in Judaism about uh, somebody who can die for your sins or suffer for you or something along those lines. Well, the problem with that is it's not true. It's patently false, actually. That in Judaism, as we're about to see today, that the suffering of Messiah is absolutely intrinsic. It's fundamental to the entire Mashiach concept. You know, something else I've heard as well is that Isaiah 53 from anti-missionaries, Isaiah 53 is not talking about the Messiah. And they, they say, well, it's talking about Israel and suffering Israel. And it, there's actually, and they talk about that's kind of on the Peshat level of the text when you look at it and so forth. But the reality is, is that, that that's true. There's, there's, that's a truth. But as some of you know, in scripture, there are many layers to scripture. And um, the reality is, is that as we're about to read today, that the concept of Isaiah 53 applying to Messiah is absolutely a thing. 100% in Judaism, I mean, not like, I, I don't, I don't use messianic sources in case you're wondering. I don't use Christian sources either, unless I'm using it to solidify the point I'm making about the false doctrines thereof. But when it comes to the Messiah, what I believe about the Messiah, why I believe in the Messiah, um, the, the aspects about the Mashiach that I believe, none of it, zero, zero zero comes from anything messianic or christian all of it comes from judaism every single bit the messiah being a lamb of god the messiah taking away our sins the messiah suffering for us the messiah being atonement all of that comes from jewish literature the messiah dying right being resurrected coming again a second time all of that's jewish all of it what I, yeah because i've heard anti-missionaries say there's no such thing as a mashiach coming twice there's no Second coming of the Messiah. What? Have you not read the Midrash Rabbah to Shir Hashirim? I mean, what? So, did not Moses come twice? Was he not rejected? 
The idea that the Jewish people are going to reject the Messiah is all part of the Messiah. <laughs> we rejected King David. In fact, every Messiah, every Redeemer, if you will, which would include Moses, David, and Joseph, every single one we have rejected, every single one have suffered for us. Anyway, I could wax eloquently on that topic for the next 30, 40 minutes. But the fact of the matter is, is that all these things are uh, basic Judaism as it relates to the Messiah. It just is. There, there's no argument against that, right? You you may not, you know, and look, <clears throat> for different reasons, people may not believe it, that Yeshua is the Messiah. Of course, I contend that if Yeshua is not the Messiah, Hasve Shalom, there won't be one. Because there's nobody who could, uh, you know, bat the batting average that he did uh, and, you know, miss the mark. It, it just, you know, anyway, it's just not going to happen. But you might say, well, you know, I don't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. Okay, fine. But you can't you can't say that the, the, the Messiah is not going to suffer for us. The Messiah is not going to die for us. The Messiah is not going to be resurrected to life. All of that is intrinsically Jewish, okay? It may make you uncomfortable. It may say, well, then, if we believe that, then aren't we being like Christians? No. Why? Because Christianity has a whole lot of other problems besides that, right? You know what I'm trying to say? I hope I'm trying to be I'm trying to be clear here. So on the one hand, the Christians believe in the suffering Messiah. Okay, great. But they also believe that that suffering Messiah came to not do away with sin, oh, no, but to do away with the Word of God to abolish the law of Moses, to completely create a brand new religion uh, whereby we do the exact opposite of everything the Bible had been saying for thousands of years. So, well, look, you know, we can approach this topic and be honest about what the Messiah is coming to do without being Christian, okay? Um, does that make sense to you? I hopefully it does. But why, is the, why am I bringing up this topic now? Well, because one of the things about the Messiah is he's referred to as the leper Messiah. I wonder why. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder why the Messiah would be called the leper Messiah in, Jude in Jewish thought if he doesn't suffer. Because he does. And so this discussion about the le leper Messiah comes up when we read Parashat Tazria, which is, in most years, is combined with Metzora, um, Tazria Metzora. Whenever this Torah portion comes up, usually somewhere embedded in that discussion is the discussion of the leper Messiah, as we're about to find out. So I'm going to be reading here from some Rabbi Trugman. I'm going to read some, some Messiah texts from Raphael Patai, and we're just going to explore this discussion about uh, the leper Messiah, the suffering Messiah, because I think, obviously, it's important for all of us because we're talking about Lapid Judaism. We want to have the right apologetics. People say to me sometimes, they're like, you know, Rabbi, are you concerned about anti-missionaries? No, because they're not trying to destroy me. I'm not a Christian. Um, <laughs> so it doesn't bother. That garlic doesn't work on me either. Um I'm not a Trinitarian. I'm not a Paulinian Christian. I don't think that the law has been abolished. I don't think that JC, quote, fulfilled the law, so I don't have to, or any of that silliness. So it doesn't work on me because I know rabbinic text. So when you say the Messiah doesn't suffer or doesn't die or there's no second coming or whatever, that doesn't work on me. It works on a Christian because all they have is the letters of Paul and a cursory reading of the so-called Old Testament. It doesn't work on me, though, because I actually know the Tanakh and the Gospels, and I actually know rabbinic literature. So I know that that's not true. And so that's why Lapid is so amazing for all of you, even if you're not uh, committed to yet to Lapid Judaism. Resistance is futile, by the way. Um, <laughs> but it's really a blessing because now you can say, yeah, it doesn't work on me either because I actually know what Judaism says and you're going to learn that today. So good morning, Devora. Glad you're here. Good morning, Christian. Hope you're doing fantastic. Good morning, Chris, Crystal. Good morning, Marita. Hope you're doing great. You and, uh, 
Patrick, good morning to you, Willie Murphy. Hey, it's been a minute, Willie, since we've seen you on the live chat, so welcome back. Good morning, Ariella. Good morning, uh, Katura. Good morning to Brenda. Hope you're doing great. Nelly, Nelly Grace. Uh, and Mr. Jerry Merritt, good morning, sir. Hope you're doing fantastic. Uh, good morning, John. Well, John, it's been a minute since we've seen you, so hope you're doing great and uh, being blessed. Good morning, Leah. Good morning, Mr. Chase Sanson. Good morning, sir. Hope you're doing great. For a deeper insight of reporting on this topic, we'll be turning to our field reporter, Chase Hansen, after these messages. Good morning, Shoshana Bruno. Hope you're doing great. Good morning, first love. Good morning to Sarah Merritt. Mrs. Sarah Merritt. Hope you're doing great. Uh, who else do we have? Sergio, good morning to you. Hope life is treating you well. And uh, Michelle Bernier, good morning to you. Dana, good morning. Kathy, good morning. Uh, Bishop uh, McCoy, good morning to you, sir. Radomir, good morning from Scotland. Radomir, good morning. Good morning to you, Matthew. Hope you're doing great. Kelly Aller, good morning to you. Kaylee Akron, good morning from Sioux City, Iowa. Kelly, is this your, Kaylee, is it Kaylee? Is this your first time to comment? Seems like I've seen you before, but maybe not. Good morning to the Rebbit scene. And Levi, good morning to you, sir. Greg Grant, hello, sir. Amana, good morning. Haas, big old Haas. Haas's nickname in high school was Tiny. Good morning, Emmanuel. Good morning, Dave. Hope you're doing great. Sarah Duncan, good morning. Uh, hope everybody's doing great. God's love, whoever you are. I hope you're doing fantastic. Good morning, Leah and uh, Tanji. Good morning, Shoshana Keith. Hope you and Yakov are doing fantastic. Eliezer, good morning to you. And uh, who else do we have? I think uh, Kevin. Kevin C. Lou, Lou Savalia, Savalia. <clears throat> Good morning to you as well. Um, yeah, listen, uh, hope everything is doing great um, in your life. So let's look at Rabbi Trugman, because this is a commentary he has in his, his uh, Torah, Torah study on Tazria. We're just going to read this section and we're going to dive into some Raphael Patai. Thank you, Hashem. Um, all right. So it says, in the previous two sections, we discussed, he, it, this is this is Rabbi Truman. He says, in the previous two sections, we discussed two different concepts that are alluded to in the portion of Tazria, the spiritual roots of disease and the messianic redemption. Okay. Remember that ta this idea of Zarat, which is translated perhaps incorrectly, leprosy. It's not really leprosy. But remember that Zarat is a spiritual disease. Good morning, Aniel. And good morning, Lori. It's a spiritual disease. And it's the only disease that is really discussed in the Torah. So <clears throat> again, I made this point earlier in the week, but it's worth repeating here that this is not about health. A lot of people dismiss this about, oh, it's just about health. We don't need that anymore because we have doctors. The priest was not a doctor. And this was all about spirit. So it says, although both had the theme of purity and impurity in common, there does, a see, there does not seem to be any other link between them. In this section, well, he says, we'll sh shed light on the connection between these seemingly unrelated matters. So he goes on to say, the link between these subjects is found in the enigmatic Talmudic discussion and Sanhedrin 98a, um, it says the Talmud symbolically depicts Mashiach as a metzora, which is one who has been stricken with the disease of Zarat, sitting with the other outcasts at the entrance to Rome. So let's pause there for a moment. And... Let's say that this point out the fest, two important facts here. Okay. The three, three. Number one, the Mashiach is depicted in the Talmud symbolically, of course, but it's more than symbolically. He's depicted as a Mazzara, one who has been stricken by Zarat. You could say a leper. Okay. That's number one. Number two, he is an outcast. Okay. This is very important. Very, very important. You have to understand when you study the Torah, you have to look at patterns. The pattern, as I mentioned earlier, 
Joseph, Moses, David. Those are you could you could add Abraham, I think, into this list. Potentially, you could add Jacob, but those three for sure. These are the sh the three redeemers. Okay, every single one of them was completely rejected by their people. You need to understand this. Joseph was completely rejected, obviously. Moses was completely rejected. They said, you're not the boss of me. Who do you think you are? You're going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? The reason that Moses was sent out into the wilderness, do you understand, was because of his people. Do you understand that? Or do you realize that? I'm serious. This is a serious question. Good morning, Matthew. Good morning, Atara. Hope you and Magan are doing great. I'm serious. It's a very serious question. Because a lot of people think, I think, that Moses was cast out into the wilderness because of Pharaoh. That's not true. Moses was cast out into the wilderness as a direct result of his people. One could even say, I think, that his people gave him over to Pharaoh, much like, you know, the, 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 the priests, the Sadducees, gave Messiah over to the Romans. So the point, in fact, is, is that Joseph was rejected, Moses was rejected, and if you've never heard the story of David, which I've told numerous times, he was absolutely rejected. He was considered an outcast. He was considered uh, an illegitimate child. He wasn't even considered a Jew. The reason that David was out in the back 40 watching the sheep where he said, you know, I had to kill a lion, how to kill a bear. The reason that his father put him out there was what it, it was be specifically because, as the ancient insights bring down, because Jesse was really, really, really hoping that David would be killed and 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 remove the shame from the family. Because everybody believed that he was the product of an adulterous relationship. Good morning, Clay. So look. The, the pattern is, is that the Mashiach has been, or excuse me, the Redeemer is always, 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 always rejected by his people, always. And here we see the Mashiach is an outcast. Now, this is very important. Why? Because, do you know, or do you realize, the only Mashiach that you supposedly cannot believe in if you're Jewish and remain a Jew is Yeshua. If I came on this program today and I told you that I believe that Schneerson was the Mashiach and became we became a Chabad community. If I came on this program and I said, I believe that Nachman is the Mashiach and we became a Breslov community or, or a Nock Nock community. If I came on this program and I said that that guy that was running around Jerusalem last year and everybody was losing their mind over, I don't even know his name, because it, it doesn't matter. Not that he doesn't matter, but he, whatever. You know what I mean? If I've said he's the Mashiach or whatever, if I said Daffy Duck was the Mashiach, I guarantee you people might think I'm Meshuggah, but they wouldn't say, well, you're you're just a Christian. You don't even know. You're not even Jewish. You're just a guy. Get out of here. They wouldn't say that. They would say, okay, well, I don't really agree with you, but hey, you know what? Who cares? Uh, come over for Shabbos. The only one you can't believe in is Yeshua. Why? Because he's been totally rejected, which, by the way, is an indication that he's the one who's truly the Mashiach, based on the pattern. Based on the pattern. Okay? I mean, look, Rabbi Akiva believed that Bar Kokhba was the Messiah. He went to his death, never saying he was wrong. And yet... You know, he's Bar Kokhba's not the Mashiach. Okay. But everybody thinks that Rabbi Akiva, and I, I agree with him that Rabbi Akiva is great. He, you know, Rabbi Akiva didn't didn't lose lose his Jew card, which I, I I agree with that. But the fact of the matter is, is that he went to his death still believing in a false messiah. So the fact that the Mashiach is rejected is a crucial aspect of the fact that he is um, that he is the Messiah. It's, it's actually a, a very important. Good morning, Moriah. So it goes on to say, 
Uh, he is told that all the others. Oh, oh, the, other, the third thing I was going to say. I'm sorry. I almost forgot. He's sitting at the entrance to Rome. Now, this is also a marvelous, very intriguing thing. It doesn't say that the Messiah is in Rome. Okay. He's not, God forbid, Roman. Okay. But he's sitting at the gates of Rome. So where are we going to find the Mashiach? Well, it's interesting. We're going to find the Mashiach at the most unlikely place, the entrance to Rome. What does Rome represent? Edom. What does Edom represent? Christianity. Is Christianity a true faith? No. 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 I tell you the truth, if I was in Jerusalem and I saw a messianic or somebody like that trying to witness to a Jew, I would step in and 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 debate on behalf of the Jew and help the Jew never become a Christian. Why? Because you know it's a, I don't want a soul sucked out of him. I don't want to want the, him to start eating uh ham and bacon and and start celebrating Christmas and walking around with an Easter ba Easter uh basket. God forbid. Better for him to be an Orthodox Jew. Why? Because at least then he still has the Mashiach because the Mashiach is the Torah. Anyway, I digress. The point, in fact, is that at the same time, the most unlikely place to find the, the, the Jewish Mashiach is at the gates of Rome. Do you agree? Isn't it interesting that that's where he is? Just like the last place you'd expect to find the Mashiach was sitting on the throne in Egypt. The last place you would expect to find the Mashiach was in Midian, in the household of a great pagan priest named Jethro. Do you agree? Where's the Jewish Messiah? He's he's you you know the the, the greatest pagan priest of all time, Jethro. He's the he's the master of all pagan religions. Yeah, I know Jethro. I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah. He's the the Mashiach is his son-in-law. What? No way. What do you mean it's his son-in-law? What are you talking about? Hey, where's the Mashiach? Hey, you know that guy, David, the one that everybody says is a product of adultery? His mother, you know, got a little loosey-goosey. You know him, the one that everybody claims that is, is a thief, and if something in town is stolen, they blame David? In fact, his name is literally a, a curse word. You're like a David. You, remember, you know that guy? Yeah, he's the Mashiach. No, stop. He's not even a Jew. Yeah, he's the Mashiach. He's not. David's not even Jewish. Doeg says he's not even Jewish. How can he be the king? He's not even a Jew. He's the product of uh, Moab. Oh, by the way, where's the Mashiach? You know that guy, that Lot? Yeah, you know, he he had the relationship with his two daughters, incest, you know? Yeah, I saw it's disgusting, man. It's gross. The guy's a nutcase. Yeah, did you know that his offspring is the Mashiach? What? The Mashiach? No way is a Mashiach. He's a Mashiach. That's, the, do you know the Mashiach came ultimately from Sodom? Sodom? God destroyed Sodom. Are you insane? No, no, really, it's true. You know, what a rabbi once said that when the Mashiach comes, we're all going to be totally stunned and shocked. I'm talking about Jews. Why? Be, just in the same way we were shocked when we looked at Joseph and said, "You're, you're I'm sorry, you're who? What? When Yosef says, Ani, Ani Yo Yosef. Ani Yosef. You know the story, Yosef stood up in front of his brothers and he started calling out. He says, where's your brother? Efo, Efo, Efo Yosef. They looked around, they kind of embarrassed. And so Yosef starts calling out, Yosef, come forth. Yosef, come forth. The brothers start looking around to all the corners of the room, expecting Yosef is going to come out some, from someplace. Then he cries out, Ani Yosef. Ani Yosef. And they, <laughs> they see Yosef sitting upon the throne. The one they rejected. The one they cast into the pit. The one they were hoping would die. The one who they said, you'll never be the boss of me. You'll never be the king of me. Never. Never is going to happen. It's never going to happen. Remember that in all cases, Joseph, Moses, David, in all three cases, Everybody said, you're never going to be the boss of me. We will, you will never be our king. You will never be, you will never be our savior. And yet, in all three cases, all three of them were literally kings. 
In all three cases, everybody literally followed them. So when you hear the one who says no one will ever follow this one, just know that he's the one. Not JC. JC's a false messiah, for sure. Why? Because JC, uh, it's, it's, I don't have to go into it. You know why. I'm not talking about JC. I'm not talking about the the, the, the Easter ham, the Christmas uh, the Christmas usher pole. I'm talking about Yeshua. The one who sits at the gates of Rome. He's not in Rome. He's not sitting on the throne of Rome. He sits at the gate of Rome. So it says here, he is told that all the others were changing their bandages, removing all of them at once, and then replacing them one by one. Mashiach takes off one bandage at a time and then replaces it before changing the next one. Why does he do this? So that if God calls him upon to reveal himself, he can do it so without delay. In other words, it goes on to say in other writings that the Mashiach is actually calling upon himself the, uh, the, the diseases of Israel, and he's bandaged up. If you see the Mashiach, he's going to look like a bandaged beggar, a bandaged Metzorah. So it says here, the fact that Mashiach is depicted as a Metzorah is exceedingly noteworthy. As the prophet Isaiah described the future Redeemer as afflicted with sickness. Wait, what? What? Yes, you've heard it here first. Thanks to our in-depth reporting by Chase Hansen. According to Rabbi Trugman, who is an Orthodox Jew, bringing this to you live, you've heard it said that Isaiah 53 is not talking about the Mashiach, but that's only because you don't read rabbinic literature, because you've been gaslighted to believe that it's somehow bad. But look what he says. He's saying here that Isaiah 53 is actually about the Mashiach. He says, he was despised and isolated from men, a man of pains and accustomed to illnesses, as one from whom we would hide our faces. He was despised. We had no regard for him. But in truth, it was our ills that he bore, our pains that he carried. But we had regarded him diseased, stricken by God, afflicted. He was pained because of our rebellious sins and oppressed through the iniquities. The chastisement upon him was for our benefit, and through his wounds we are healed. This is Rabbi Truman talking about the Messiah, quoting Isaiah 53, 3 through 5. And this is not an isolated thing that you might be saying, oh, wow, you found one source out of a million. No, 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 no. This is common. It's common. In fact, it's even in the Yom Kippur Makzor. The prayer book for Yom Kippur has a section, it's all in Hebrew and left untranslated, I wonder why, that talks about the Mashiach suffering for our sins, and it quotes Isaiah 53. So it says, Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsburg explains that being stricken with a sickness is an opportunity for personal growth. Such an experience enables us to atone for our misdeeds and learn important lessons of empathy and discuss the first, as discussed in the first section of this portion. Throughout the ages, Zadikim, that is righteous and holy individuals, used their afflictions to both identify and empathize with the sufferings of others, as well as to elicit compassion from heaven for the world's plight. Each person, in fact, has the potential to act like a Zadik and transform sickness into a catalyst for rectification. Mashiach, the quintessential Zadik, will, will be able to take his suffering and transform it into healing energy that will envelop the nation of Israel and the entire world. Judaism teaches that the um, the Mashiach, or excuse me, let me rephrase. First, let me say this. Judaism teaches that the Zadikim suffer, and as a result of their suffering, we receive atonement. That is absolutely a Jewish thought, 100%. 100%. Mashiach is, as I just read, the quintessential Zadik. And so whereas a Zadik will or can 
through his suffering, bring atonement to his generation. That's in Jewish thought, I'm telling you. The Mashiach, who is the quintessential Sadiq, brings atonement through his suffering for all generations. Okay? This is from uh, some insights here about the leper Messiah. It says, on Friday afternoon, a young Talmudic scholar was riding with the Baal Shem Tov in a cart across the open field, when all of a sudden he, he saw a village in the distance and was filled with joy, for he thought that they would be surely spend the night, the Shabbat night there, as, as aside from having to just stay in the open field. And at that very moment, they entered the village, and behold, the horse went off on its own through the village and did not stop at any house. The youth became saddened by this, for it seemed that they would, after all, not spend the Shabbat in the village. But when the horse reached the end of the village, it stopped in front of a ruin. The youth thought that they would spend the Sabbath in that ruin and became filled with joy, for it was better than staying in the field. And the Baal Shem Tov entered the ruin, and the youth went after him, and behold, in the ruin lived, there was a, the, the, in the ruined house, lived an old man, a leper. From head to foot, was no hell spot in his body. He was so full of wounds and boils. And, it, and he had wife and ch children walked around in torn and tattered garments. When the Baal Shem Tov opened the door, the old man became filled with joy, ran up to the Baal Shem Tov and said to him, Peace be upon you, master and teacher. And he who saw not their joy had never seen joy in his entire life. And they went into a separate room and talked there about a half an hour. And then they looked for permission from one another and parted from each other in fierce love like the love of David and Jonathan. And then the Baal Shem Tov took his seat in the cart and the horse trotted along its way. On the way back home, the youth asked the Baal Shem Tov, what was the meaning of the joy that was encountered there between you and the old, the old leper? The Baal Shem Tov said to him, as for what has happened between me and the old man in the village, it is known that there the Messiah exists in every generation in this world and reality clothed in a body. What? Did you, did you hear what I just said? The Mashiach exists. In other words, the Mashiach is present in every generation, clothed in a body. Well, why wouldn't he be clothed in the body? I thought the Mashiach was a man. Aren't men flesh and blood? Of course they're going to be clothed in a body. Unless the Mashiach is something greater. The Baal Shem Tov says that he's clothed in a body. Hmm. And if the generation is worthy, he is ready to reveal himself. And if, God forbid, they are not worthy, he departs. And behold, that old man was ready to be our true Messiah. If, and it was his desire to enjoy my company on the Shemot. But I foresaw that he would depart after the third meal. And I did not want to endure the pain of that Shabbat, having seen the Messiah leave. I wanted to read you that story because... It's indicative of the fact that the Messiah is often portrayed as a, a Zara, somebody reflected with Zarat, as we see in our portion here. Okay, a couple more insights here before we uh, before we conclude. It says the sufferings Israel must face in the days of the Messiah are temporary and transitory. They will last, according to the Talmudic view quoted in the preceding chapter, seven years. A later Agatha, of which we shall hear more, reduces this period to just 45 days. The Messiah himself, on the other hand, must spend his entire life, from the moment of his creation until the time of his advent, many centuries or even millennia, in a state of constant and acute suffering. Despised. Now, I want you to listen to these words because I'm reading, I'm quoting here from, these are these are Midrashic works. But I want you to listen. The Mashiach is despised. Despised by who? By Jews. What? By Israel. Remember, Joseph was despised. Moses was despised. David was despised. Oh, yes, now we love them. Now we're like, oh, they're amazing. But when in their day, they were hated by their own people. Now, 
Goyim have used this to become anti-Semites and to want to kill Jews and so forth. That's not what we're talking about here. What I'm trying to articulate to us is that as Jews, we have to understand that one of the prerequisites of the Mashiach is that we hate him. And listen, I don't have time. I don't have time to go through all the sources to prove this point. You're just going to have to trust me. It's written. The sages will go out to Galilee. It literally says, the sages will go out to Galilee. They'll ask the Mashiach, are you the Mashiach? He'll say, yes, I am. And it says, we will hate him. It literally says that in the, in the Midrashim. So everybody thinks, well, the Mashiach comes, we'll love him. It'll be amazing. No, we won't. When the Mashiach comes, we're going to hate him. That's a prerequisite, actually. And yes, it's in Judaism. We'll say, well, show me where that is in the Tanakh. Guys, there's nothing about the Mashiach in the Tanakh. Not unless you read into it. <laughs> Just like you can't. Where's that in the Torah? Where's heaven and hell in the Torah? Where's the angels in the Torah? You see? So it says, despised and afflicted with un unhealing wounds. He sits in the gates of Rome and winds and unwinds the bandages of his festering sores. As the Midrash expresses it, pains have adopted him. According to one of the most moving and at the same time psychologically most meaningful of all Messianic legends, God, when he created the Messiah, gave him the choice of whether or not to accept the sufferings of the sins of Israel upon himself. I'm sorry, what? The Mashiach takes upon himself the sins of Israel? No. You, a man can't take upon another man's sins. Does the Bible, does the Tanakh actually say that, by the way? No, it doesn't, actually. What? It doesn't. No. The, there's the verse in the Torah that everybody cites about that, where it's talking about a, a man, you know, a, a father should not die for his son's sins. Uh, when you actually study the Halakha about that and the insights, that is talking about due process in a court of law. Meaning that a father cannot be a witness against a son and vice versa. In fact, no family member can. It has nothing to do about you can't die for your sins. It has to do with due process. It's court procedure. <laughs> no, all right? This is why, again, again, it's why studying rabbinic literature is so important. It's so important. Because at the Peshat level, you say, oh, look, that means that nobody can die for your sins. But actually, that's not what it means. This is why the oral Torah is important. The only reason people stop believing in Yeshua once they hear an anti-missionary is because they have no experience in rabbinic literature. That's the problem. That's why Christians are easy targets. Well, Christians are easy targets because their Bible is a bunch of man's letters. But putting that aside... That's usually the issue. So it says here, so God is asking the Messiah, do you want to suffer for the sins of Israel? We're almost done. This will be the last thing. Messiah answered him and said, I accept it with joy so that not a single soul of Israel should perish. Wait, what? The Messiah is becoming an atonement for us? That's what he says. In the later Zorak, Zoraic formulation of this legend, the Messiah himself summons all the diseases, pains, and sufferings of Israel to call upon him, to come upon him, in order thus to ease the anguish of Israel, which otherwise would be unbearable. In other words, if we're able to endure, it's because the Messiah has accepted upon himself, called upon himself, all of our diseases, all of our sufferings, so that we can make it. End of our Aliyah today. There is a lot more to this topic. I simply am out of time. I am never out of content. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being faithful to the Aliyah. Thank you being, for being faithful in your giving and your financial support. If you enjoy these programs, please look at the description of any video and find the way that you can contribute financially. We need your support. If you're a member of the Lapid Nation, you consider this your home and uh, you're you're here, please be a tither. Uh, I want everybody to be a tither. None of this 2%, 3% nonsense. That's that's for the goyim. That's not for us. Uh, we're committed to Torah. If you want to be committed to Torah, that means you're a tither. 
So thank you so much for being here. I There's going to be some uh, more teachings here, some more Musar. There's going to be uh, later tonight, uh, Zeke and Yigal will be joining us uh, for the reading of, uh, of the Teshuvah book. Until then, have a great and amazing day. We'll look forward. I will be back with you tomorrow. Bezrat Hashem. Until then, have a blessed and amazing day.